Hey, 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 what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Master and Drum Whiskey Room on a beautiful whiskey Wednesday night here in uh, Bro, Ohio in the Midwest. Hope everyone's having a great night tonight. What is going on? Uh, can you please talk about Still Austin at some point on this live? Yes, we will talk about that a little bit. Um, I made it out to one of these. It's been a minute. Rob Shields, Rob Zilla. Damn, dude. Nice to see you. It's been a minute. Uh, what is going on? Let's see. What's up, Jason? Make this night of work go faster for me. <laughs> we'll do, Devin. Uh, Dunny says that pearl kit sounds good on the intro. I think it's a pearl kit. It could be. It could be a pearl kit. Uh, what is going on, everybody? If, uh, if it's your first time uh, listening or watching, I am Jason C., the host of The Mash and Drum. Welcome to the show. Tonight, we have a lot of whiskey to get to. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to try most of it. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of whiskey here that um, I, I have yet to get some samples of. I was away uh, in Washington, D.C. the last two days for my other job. So I was, um, you know, traveling a bit. So I had a little bit to catch up on here. So as soon as I got back, I'm like, man, what am I doing tonight? Let's uh, let's see what we can um, let's see what we can muster up here. So tonight we're going to start with a bottle that I've been meaning to taste, especially live. And that is Matt Porter, uh, his first Barrel King blend that he did. Uh, if any of you do not know, Matt Porter, a.k.a. ADHD Whiskey, um, is has been deemed a master blender over at Barrel King, very fittingly, because the guy could just blend his ass off. And this is his first blend that he made for Barrel King. We'll get into all the details of it. And I think there are still some of these bottles left, so you guys might be able to score one if you'd like. So we'll go through all that. Uh, let's see. First, as always, let's say hi to some people in the chat because I miss all of you. Uh, let's see. Kenneth Rathburn already starting off. Uh, I ain't buying old force or brow strength anymore. Hot, young, messy and overpriced. All right. Okay. Uh, we'll get to the list. I, I did. I do have the full list with everybody. Uh, everybody's thoughts and comments on it. It was pretty interesting going through everything. Uh, Justin Jenkins is here. What is going on, man? EJ in the house. We also have Mr. Russ L. Uh, Alec S is here. He picked up a Starlight Honey finish, and it's fantastic. Highly recommends it. Sandeep Chima is here. How are you doing, Sandeep? Tony Bag of Donuts in the house. Josh Fritz is here. Joey B. What's going on, Joey? Uh, Derek Hawkins is here. Michael Speakerman. We have Boyd Mason Lake. What's going on, Boyd? Nice to see you, man. He said he's taking a break from Elijah Craig Single Barrel Barrel Proof. Really? That's a new one. Haven't heard that one yet. Uh, Mr. Mark S is in the house. What's going on, Mark? Nice to see you. Christopher David, uh, it's, it was today your birthday or the day before? You had a recent birthday. Cheers to you, Chris David. Happy birthday, man. If I missed it. Sorry if I missed it. <laughs> uh, Dunny, Jason C is here, uh, and friends. Awesome. Daniel Sutherland is here. Giselle's Boston. What is going on, buddy? Nice to see you as always. We have Tim Cornet in the house. We have Dr. Sped. I'm not buying Blanton's anymore anymore. Y'all can have it. Uh, that was a pretty, you know, that actually, that bottle didn't come up. Well, we'll get into that. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to squeeze too much juice out just yet. <laughs> uh, whiskey juice, speaking of juice coming in from the land of 10,000 lakes skull. What's going on? Having fun in Minnesota. Mr. M Mushnick is here. Simming some Redwood Empire Lost Monarch. Uh, always a good favorite. JG in the house. Bose wine guy. Straight up sips is here. Uh, let's see. Jason Mounts is here. Joseph Yoon. Imagine people still playing ridiculous markups for a bottle in 2024. Inflation. Hey, people are doing it. People want that whiskey sometimes, man. Yeah, buddy. Lightweight, baby. <laughs> Says Rare Breed. Uh, Justin Mills just became a YouTube member. What is going on, man? Uh, Four Leaf Whiskey. How are you doing, Stacy? Nice to see you. Guys, for all the anything you want to know about Irish whiskey, Four Leaf Whiskey is the one to, to, uh, to watch on YouTube. Go subscribe to her. Bill Reynolds is here. Line LG. Liddy Casanova. Jason, glad you're back. Is it worth getting the new Hooten Young Warrior Whiskey for 16 year? Uh, uh, Liddy, I, I wish I could tell you, give you advice here. I, I just haven't tasted it yet. Generally, those are all light whiskey. So if you like really super sweet whiskeys, um, then Hooten Young would probably be up your alley. Don't think it's like a 16 year, um, you know, bourbon or rye. It's probably mostly light whiskey. So if you're into that, maybe, but I don't know. It's probably pretty, pretty expensive. Whiskey Tornado is here. What's going on, Lance? Whiskey Tornado should have a million subscribers by now. I don't know why uh, Lance is, uh, you know, still like 
I don't know, Lance. I, I feel like your your channel should have way more views than than it should be. So everyone go subscribe to Whiskey Tornado. Uh, JG's in the house. What's going on, man? Bob Glass is here. Cool running. Jason Mounts. James Morgan. Uh, let's see. Norman Latva and a bunch more people came coming in. Abrod is here. And I'm just going to keep catching up here. Okay. I think I'm all... I think I'm all caught up. Looks like a great lineup tonight, Doug Pearson. Yeah, so we're going to taste um, ADHD's uh, blend here. We're going to get into some samples I got sent from Glens Creek Distilling, which is a brand that I heard a, you know heard about a while back, but I can't say I've had anything from them since. But you know, the owner watches my channel, and he wanted to send me some samples. He said he likes my honesty and wants me to um critique his whiskey so we'll do some live reviews tonight of some of this stuff uh chad hurry hey you guys what's going on <laughs> uh oh adh is in the in the chat i think i i think i missed them where's he at uh straight up sips jason let's see here gabagool hey there he is adhd whiskey what is going on maddie maddie we're gonna be uh diving into your uh to your uh blend here barrel and bottle what's up love the videos thank you so much man uh, I'm not buying Eagle, <laughs> Double Eagle Rare or OFC anymore. Anymore. You've had a chance to get more than one. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Ephraim Gonzalez, 1792 foolproof is so underrated. We'll get into that too. Um, that probably might be the most defended bottle from the video, which I thought was really interesting. But after going through all the, um, after going through all the different comments, I kind of curated everything the last couple days. It was like over 450 comments. Wrote down all the bottles that people were calling out. And there were some big surprises in there for me to see, as well as some, um, uh, as well as some, I guess, some of the ones that I mentioned too. So it'll be interesting to kind of go through the list and kind of comment on them, see your reactions in the chat and see how that went. But without further ado, it's Whiskey Wednesday, man. Let's start it off. Barrel King. Look at that. Who's that? Who's that beautiful guy right there? Matt Porter, Matt friggin Porter, uh, batch number 81. So this is a really cool blend. And Maddie, if, um, since you're in the chat, I, I don't, I don't know if, if this whole thing was your brainchild and forgive me if I haven't, you know, caught up on, um, exactly how this specific blend came to be. Cause it's super unique. So batch number 81 barrel King for Mr. Matt Porter, eight barrels total blended six barrels, of nine year, which is 90% of the batch. So you have six barrels of nine year old bourbon, which is 90% of the batch. Um, then we have two barrels of seven to eight year. Uh, all right. This is dumped. Uh, the dumped blend went into four Elijah Craig 23 barrels, satin barrels for 16 hours, and then put them back in the tank. Then they put partial, uh, they put partial blend back into best EC 23 barrel for 24 hour finish. And then added it back into the batch. Then they put partial of the blend into the best EC23 barrel for an eight-hour finish. Added it back into the batch. Then they finished EC23 barrels three times until they got their desired finish profile. So pretty crazy. I mean, I, I don't know. Was this something that was uh, Matt? Was that Beth Porter said, "Hey, that's a pick of my son." <laughs> <laughs> is that a figure of your son? Does your son look just like Matt? Because <laughs> that would be amazing. Doug Pearson says, oh, wow, I'm so, so so confused. So, yeah, so essentially the nine-barrel blend, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, the eight-barrel blend was had partial finishing touches into some different barrels for over a specific amount of time until they were all blended again. So, um, so yeah. Raging Irishman is listening in between arguing on a work call with people in Australia. Go easy on him, man. All right. Whiskey, uh, Gary Francis says ADHD whiskey playing the hokey pokey with them barrels. I love it. Yeah, when I when I read the, you know, the steps to make this, I was I was like, man, that is a that is a really cool idea just to kind of, you know, mess with some different some time frames, blend them together, see how that works even though it's you know, it, it, it's kind of cool. So I am, uh, JG sounds similar to my blend. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> all right, let's dive into this one, guys. So I'm curious to see if this is, um, 
if this is going to have some notes of, you know, some Elijah Craig in it. Obviously, this is, uh, well, not obviously, but this is NGP. This is NGP uh, nine year and seven, eight year. So let's check it out. Bold strategy, Cotton. See if it works out for him. Oh, man. I, I think the one thing I'm getting from Elijah Craig that I normally get is a nice cherry note. Now, I'm not really sure if that's... I don't normally get a lot of cherry from MGP unless it's a really higher aged MGP, but I'm getting nice little cherry note in here. Big Vic, I bet it smells like churros. Yeah, it does not at all. Get a nice like gingerbread cinnamon type note in here. It's kind of warming, honestly. Um, yeah, if you guys could hit the like button while you're hanging out here, we already have 292 people here watching. So come hang out. Uh, hey, what's up, Harry Turner? Nice to see you, man. Peter Slonsky, yeah, Marzipan, no. I can't say, I'm not going to say the M word because then I get charged like 10 bucks. I'm guessing this is the 21% MGP mash. If there were two different mashes, if he was using some of the 36% stuff, I, I would imagine it would have been noted. Um, man, the nose is fantastic. It's kind of like borderline old school NGP with kind of a hint of like this cherry chocolate cinnamon. But I will say the more I'm diving into this, the more fruit forward it's getting. So I think the cherry is just getting a little bit stronger. I'm wondering, some, uh, I'm wondering if some other, um, some other flavors come to the forefront here. ADHC all 20, 21%. What's up, Dolomite74 from Cincy? What's going on, man? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the stuff. Oh, man, the finish on it. And this is not my first pour of the day, like you guys. I always get asked, you know, if you – if you uh, drink anything beforehand, kind of pregame, I totally do. I always start off with like Wild Turkey 101 or Evan Williams 1783, just kind of pregame a little bit. So even with having some of that before the show, this um, is carrying a huge finish. But man, I'm absolutely loving the mix of like dark fruit and cinnamon in this. Um, and I, I feel like I am, I don't know, maybe it's my head playing with me. That could totally be it, but... As you kind of get into the ECBP notes, and there, I feel like there is a little bit of a nutty characteristic there, which is nice. Yeah, and the more I drink this, I think the more fruit forward it's getting in a really good way. Dude, that thing is all over the place. It's like every time you take a sip, you just get something a little bit different. Um, let's see, Jason, have you reviewed Fry Ranch yet? Uh, way back I did, but we're about to do a, uh, we're about to do a, a pick of Fry Ranch soon for Master Journey Whiskey Club. So yeah, see, I love when blends do this where it can get both light and dark. You get some of those really nice, um, kind of those nice, like textured, like toffee notes, a little bit of nuttiness, some almond and then as you sip it, it just gets into like this like fruit forward character. It's all very rich. It's got a great texture to it. Like, you know, anytime I've ever gotten a, a blend from Matt, you know, the texture has always been pretty great. Um, so this is available actually right now at Barrel King. Um, if you want, if you want to grab this one, I think there's about a hundred bottles of this left. And Matt, you can correct me. Um, I was talking to um, I was talking to Jared today over at Barrel King, and he said there was about 100 bottles of this left. Um, so if you want to join in and get access to some of Matt's barrels, just uh, become a member of Barrel King, and then you'll have access to buy this batch number 81. It's really nice. I think it's about 130 bucks that you pay, but you get access to all the bottles. And um, it's a – yeah, I, I mean, if you guys haven't kind of found out yet what Barrel King is doing, I know there's a lot of – you know, there were a few channels kind of talking about them here and there. 
I absolutely love what they're doing. They're doing very unique stuff. Now, I know people are like, oh, I have more MGP. But the stuff that they're doing with it, like what Matt's doing with it, I think is what makes them stand out. It's not just blending some ages together. They're actually really, you know, strategically thinking exactly what they can do with it here and there. Um, different type of barrel chars, different types of uh, finishing barrels using old bourbon barrels to double oak it. I mean, it's it's really cool. And, you know, they do a lot of other stuff, too. Their toasted vanilla series, I know, is pretty popular. So. All right. So now I'm getting a little bit more of the citrus now poking through from the MGP. So the more you sip this, I think the more it just kind of you start just picking up different things. But the main notes I'm getting here, it seems is I'm getting a really nice toffee almond up front with a little bit like that nuttiness characteristic. Once it hits mid palate, it goes full fruit flavor for me. A, lot of, a little bit of like that gingerbread. And then on the back end, it is spicy. It is rich. Great texture. Yeah, man. Um, so hear me out. Take that approach with me. 36% uh, MGP and finish it in four roses. Oh, yeast string barrels and Parker's rye barrels. Yeah, I mean, that could... You never know, man. That could be pretty crazy. Um, is it completely unique or do you find it similar to anything else as Doug Pearson? <sighs> man, that's a good question. Um, I don't know because it has like I I, I think it's I think it's it leans more towards an MGP type flavor profile with like the best attributes that you get from Elijah Craig barrel proof. So all these different nuances that come into play from the finishing time. But, uh, you know, I'll also give it this, you know, like sometimes you get like a double oaked product, especially like today. And you get like that weird aspartame, uh, like artificial sweetener, like type of uh, bitterness that you get on the back end of that. That happens a lot today when you, especially when you're double oaking. I get it all the time with like Woodford stuff and, and um, like toasted barrels. I get it with a lot. Um, and then a, a lot of these other NDPs that are, you know, doing some double oaking to kind of accelerate, you know, the process. There are very few distilleries I don't get that from. I would say Natural Barrel Company is one of those. And I think this is another one. Um, I think that this blend in particular does not give me that at all. I think it's, I think what Matt did here is just kind of pick up the best attributes of, of what Elijah Craig could bring to the table here. It's really, really good. Yeah, Matt. I mean, this is, this is so good, man. Congratulations, dude. This has everything I love about an MGP bourbon, especially around nine years old. And then, again, some of those little nuances that you get with the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. And you know what? The, the oak is there, but it's not super heavy either. The oak is there to let you know that there is some age here. Uh, but, man, that's delicious. I got to say, it, it's been kind of a slow go this year, a slow start for uh, some bourbons. Not a lot of great ones that I've tasted, you know, you know, from the big, I guess from the big distillers, some unique ones. I, I do kind of like the, some of the creativity of some, but so far, like a logic, like barrel proof, larceny barrel proof, you know, the A124s, those really didn't excite me too much this year. I think the best whiskey I've had is, has been a rye, um, to be honest. Actually, this new Riff 8 year, I really, really did enjoy, but um, I would put this right up there so far this year. Shoot, I like this better than the Heaven Hill 18. The Heaven Hill 18 was a little bit too uh a little bit too soft <laughs> for me. I was like freaking out too because when I had Connor on from Heaven Hill, I had just released that that uh that review for the Heaven Hill 18, uh the the uh heritage collection. You know, I didn't really give it a favorable review. I mean, it's a solid bourbon, but not for 300 bucks. And um, I don't know if you saw it. <laughs> I, he acted like he didn't see it. He acted like he was pretty happy to be here. But, uh, but yeah, that's what I, I mean. That's what I, like I don't give a, you know, I don't give a shit. If, if I don't like a whiskey, I'm going to tell you. I don't care who's coming on.
Judd Porter says ADHD whiskey threw some stuff at the wall and it stuck. I hope I can find a bottle. <laughs> yeah, I think overall the bourbon market is slowing down. Maybe uh, bourbon, uh, maybe distillers are being a little bit more strategic about what they put out rather than, you know, just putting out a million different things at the same time with different finishes and uh, different types of mash bills and something that's a little bit more. I don't know, something that's a little bit more trendy. Um, I still think, you know, we're going to see that, but, you know, I don't know. It, it's, I feel like bourbon, bourbon and just American whiskey makers should be a little bit more strategic what they're putting out because the market can't handle any more influx of whiskeys. There's just too much competition. You got to do something different, but it's got to be good. You got to be able to market it. 90% of bourbon guys is, is marketing, marketing, bottle design. I don't think people realize how much that goes into, you know, selling a bottle of bourbon. It really is important. It's why it's, it's, it's so important, um, especially now in today's time. So, um, I mean, I think whiskey geeks, we more, we worry more about what's in the bottle, you know, all the time, but when you kind of have out, now remember the whiskey geek market, I think is a pretty small market compared to the rest of casual or maybe, you know, intermediate like whiskey geeks, but they're looking for like that, the one with the best story, the one with the best bottle design. And I think that's a majority of the market. So just my two cents. Jimmy Copeland is here. That's why we love you. You keep it real as F. Thank you so much, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, cheers, Bourbon Bill. Hope all is well. What is going on, Brian Tracy? Nice to see. I think buyers are being more strategic. Absolutely, Ben. I think it's kind of on both sides. I think it's a great point. Uh, what about James E. Pepper Cast Ring? I think, oh, yeah, that was a very nice surprise this year. That was a very, very nice surprise. That's right. Um, let's see. I definitely feel decision paralysis when browsing whiskey selections. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, like, I don't know, like bottles like this is what gets me excited when people that I know in the industry are trying something new or doing something new. And between both Barrel King and Matt, I think it's a, this is a, this is a home run. I could drink this all night. This is delicious. And like I said, you know, I am not just saying that because I love Matt, but this is a really, really beautifully balanced blend. Like I said, so it's, um, and I'm telling you, the more you drink it, like Matt, like when are you going to like, when are you going to release something like the blueberry blend? Cause I just want to see you say blueberries, like the entire time blueberries. And this is getting more fruit forward. Like I've been saying, the more I sip it. So maybe a blueberry will poke out or snozberry. Who knows? How many bottles do you need to own to be a whiskey geek? See, so that's the thing. I never go by bottle count. I go by which bottles you have. If you have a million bottles, but they're all Buffalo Trace and all this allocated bullshit, that doesn't impress me. But if you have 25 bottles of like the coolest single barrels that are out there, I'd respect that more than the guy that has, you know, uh, you know, 10 bottles of Pappy. Like it doesn't impress me. Back Way back when that shit would impress me. But like, oh my God, you got Pappy. I'm all over it. Let me try some, you know, give me all of it. But, you know, today's market, that stuff doesn't impress me at all. All right. You have a bunch of Weller full proofs. You have this. I, I don't care. She, give me something unique. I don't care. So that's that's basically what it is. Yeah. That don't impress me much, says Shania Twain. That's right. Barrel King is fantastic. Uh, Whiskey Tornado says nothing will make a company go broke quicker than only catering to us whiskey nerds. <laughs> that is a very true statement. <laughs> that is a very true statement. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, when you're looking at, um, when you're looking at the whiskey market today, again, I just think there are so many people that are still kind of getting into it, but you know, we're being a little bit more selective. And like I said, the, the, the whiskey market, what's on the shelf, what's available. It is all over the place. There's so much stuff out there. It's really hard to, for especially a new drinker nowadays to even get into all the stuff that we're into. They just want to pick something decent on the shelf that's a good price. And I feel like when you find that and then you realize how hard it is to get uh, allocated stuff, the, you know, kind of the uh, the interest 
it starts to sway a lot quicker now than it used to, I think. So uh, the guy with a cellar of mellow corn is a whiskey. Yes, Eddie. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Say the word and I could send you some Ranger Creek. Amazing Texas bourbon says Mr. Mushnick. Oh, might have to uh, might have to check that one out. Uh, hey, Black Bourbon family is here. What's going on, Jason and Brandy? Nice to see you guys. Jason, I have not forgot about you. Uh, just got back from a work trip, so I will get some samples together. We will collapse soon. Um, let's see here. Uh, Master and Drum, do you, did you kill What's on the Shelf Wednesday? Because that would sadden me. No, I haven't. It's just that like the timing for me to film What's on the Shelf Wednesday has, it's been a little bit tough, but uh, it's, it's interesting you brought that up because I was just thinking about that last week. And there are so many bottles on the shelf that I haven't been able to review yet that I need to bring back and, and do that with. So it will be coming back soon. It's just a matter of going to the store and kind of looking around the shelf and figure out what bottles that I can, you know, bring to the table. Because, again, my whiskey selection could be a lot different than yours. So uh, let's see. Uh, Bourbon Bill's talking to BT. All right. So I'm going to keep. Uh, let's see. Judd Porter says, hit the like button. Only seven likes. I don't know. Maybe refresh it. Maybe there's more than seven. I hope. Ah, oh, see, what's that now? See, this is the also the beauty of blends, guys. Blends could start getting real good as it sits out, gets a little airtime. I'm a huge believer that airtime definitely can make it work a little bit. See, now I'm getting a little bit of like a smoky, like a smoked chocolate, like a barrel char note to kind of go with that fruit. Man, I don't think I'm getting it on the palate, but I'm getting a little bit on the nose, to be honest. But yeah, that's killer. I mean, if there are a hundred bottles left of this, then you know people better move fast because that shit's delicious. Um, yeah, just saying. Go to Barrel King, join, get one. It's good stuff, really good stuff. So, congrats, Matt. Happy for you, man. Uh, all right, so let's go to a few news stories here. Nothing crazy, not too many news stories because there's a lot of whiskey we got to get to tonight. And we're obviously going to talk about the um, uh, the bourbons we're not buying, go through all your results in the comments. Been wanting to do this for a few weeks. And tonight's the night. So let's go to the first news story here. And that is Maker's Mark. Um, looks like that they are launching a limited whiskey series that honors racing thoroughbreds of the past starting with Man O' War. So Keeneland Racecourse and Maker's Mark announced in, on Thursday a new decade-spanning whiskey series honoring the great racing thoroughbreds of the past with a different horse feature each year. The first release of the Greats of the Gate uh, will feature Man of War, who completely shortly uh, who competed shortly after World War I and was considered one of the greatest racehorses in history after winning 20 out of 21 races. Uh, the limited release will hit the shelves of specialized retailers in Kentucky starting in October. And the bottle is labeled with an illustration by local. I'm not sure if that October date is right. That seems late. Um, the bottle is wrapped with a yellow and black and nod to Man of War Racing's colors. Profits from the sales of each bottle from the Greats of the Gate series will go to nonprofit supporting Kentucky hospitality, arts, and the horse racing industry. Um, there is no, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's no information here on price. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much it's going to cost, but... I don't know. The yellow wax is kind of nice. You guys dig the yellow wax, wax at least. I mean, I don't know. Kind of cool. Um, it, it, there, I don't think there's anything different with the bourbon. It's just Maker's Mark wearing some new clothes. That's all it is. Some new colors. Uh, the, the design of the label is actually pretty cool. Now, I don't know if that, that looks like that's all three sides uh, of the bottle there. So you can see the Man of War uh, on one side of the bottle, then the front, and then the uh, the other side. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Jose Mario saying, love your channel. Keep up the good work. Can you explain how Barrel King subscription works? Do you get the option to buy the previous batches or barrel picks or do they determine what you get sent? No, you have the option to buy, I think whatever's left, um, Jose. So like I said, if there's some of, you know, these left then you get that. And I forgot how it works exactly. You could go look it up on the website on Barrel King. They give you all the information. I, I think that when you, when you, uh, subscribe, I think you get a bottle or two like as part of your subscription. And then there are others that come along that you get first access to. Um, I think there, I think there are a couple different levels 
as well. So I don't know, just go check it out, man. I, I love what they're doing. So yeah, it's just regular makers in, in, in yellow wax. Um, October release likely tied to the fall meet at Keeneland. Keeneland runs it. Oh, okay. So it probably is October. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for clarifying. It probably uh, doesn't. That, that goes to show you how much I know about horse racing. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, let's go to the next one. We are going to, let's see. Oh, Metallica is back. Ride the lightning. Well, or, or blackened, I should say. So uh, let's go to, uh, let's see. Let's go to this whiskey release. So when lightning strikes twice, Metallica's blackened whiskey brings back their popular rye expression named after a beloved album. So Rye the Lightning, which was introduced in 2022, is back for a suggested retail price of $69.99. It can be ordered online or purchased at select retailers. retailers. It's bottled at 92 proof, and it's a blend of rye whiskey selected by Black and Master Distiller and Master Blender, Rob Dietrich. So um, let's see. Obviously, if you guys don't know what they, what they utilize, they use the Black Noise sonic enhancement process in which the barrels of whiskey are exposed to low hertz sound waves. According to Blacken, these sound waves agitate the liquid inside the barrels, increasing its interaction with the wooden staves and releasing additional compounds of flavors. So uh, so, so there you go. So if you're a huge Metallica fan, anybody in the chat a big fan of Rye the Lightning, anybody got to try it? I got to try it in 2022. I thought it was a pretty nice rye whiskey. I don't know about all the sonic noise stuff. I mean, that seems cheeky and a little bit gimmicky. I get it, but you know, agitating the whiskey barrel inside the barrel isn't anything new. It's kind of a a, 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 um, a more creative way to rotate barrels or move barrels around, or you know, it's just kind of a more unique way to do it. So, uh, let's see. Let's get into this release, and this is a bottle that I literally just reviewed uh, last week, and this is probably one of my favorite releases of the year and it's not because the 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 whiskey itself is you know i feel like it's amazing it's a game changer but i feel like this is a really really cool way to give you give us a throwback type of bottle at a really good price so overholt releases rye whiskey ingrained in american history with a mash bill that dates back to 1810 so beam some tory and whiskey brand overholt announced the release of a overholt straight rye whiskey on wednesday According to the brand, the whiskey is distilled from the mash bill Abraham Overholt used in 1810, a mixture of 80% rye and 20% soft malted barley, replicating rye whiskey enjoyed in the 1800s. So price, 40 bucks. Uh, proof of this one, 95 proof. And let's see. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. It's. I will say this about it. It's... For an 80% rye whiskey, it's not the most in-your-face rye whiskey you're going to try. I think it's a little bit more delicate than what you may find or than what you may think with an 80% rye mash bill. This is not along the profiles of a 95.5 rye at all. It's more fruit forward than I think you would expect. It's a little bit sweeter, but the spice really comes to the forefront on the back end of the uh, of the entire whiskey. That's where you really get the spice of it. I think the soft, malt, uh, the soft malted barley they use really does kind of soften the whole experience. It's more floral and sweet. Um, so if you guys have had anything from Leopold Brothers, where it's a very floral type of rye whiskey, I'm not going to say it's that floral, but there's a reminder there of what that whiskey is. So that's all I got to say about that. Um, let's see. It's got <laughs> it's searching for that overhaul. It's a rise, right? <clears throat> Your body's a wonderline by John Mayer. Okay. Overholt is on my radar. Yeah. I just think that's the way you do a throwback whiskey. You do a nice amber glass, cool label, make it affordable. Give us a, a, a heritage style mash bill. That's how you do it. Jim Beam killing it lately. Love what Jim Beam is doing. Even going back to last year. I think they're absolutely killing it. Uh, and last but not least, let's talk about this bottle. This is crazy. Um, so for all you... Irish whiskey fans out there. This is a 49-year-old Irish whiskey, I believe. Uh, this is from Middleton. So it spent nearly 50 years aging and cost $55,000. So 
So Middleton, very rare, the producer of very rare Irish whiskeys. Uh, they consider themselves the pinnacle of Irish whiskey. Announced the fifth release in its silent distillery collection. At 49 years old, Middleton Very Rare Silent Distillery Collection Chapter 5 is Middleton's oldest whiskey to date and was distilled in 1973 by master distiller Max Crockett, who made the whiskey using the world's largest pot still. Um, the final blend spent six months aging in cask number 52969, which is an ex-bourbon barrel uh, that was repaired in the 1970s. It was Every, everything that was uh, aged here is all ex-bourbon guys, including that final blend. 52.4% uh, ABV, so that's 104.8 proof. It's available online through Middleton and select retailers. Uh, 55 grand. If you have, if you got the money, I don't know. If you got the money. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I see myself spending the money on that. My goodness gracious. Um, all right. And then we have a couple of labels I want to show you from the TTB guys. And one of them I'm pretty excited about. Speaking of Jim Beam, we have this label right here, Jim Beam Winter Reserve, uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey Winter Reserve Notes of Vanilla and Cinnamon. So this looks like to be a very fall forward type of type of bourbon whiskey. I mean, it says bourbon whiskey. I don't think it's flavored. But I'd be curious, why does it have such um, uh, big notes of vanilla and clove? But if you look on the left side of the label there in the top, it says um, new toasted white oak barrel. So this may have a, a new type of toast profile that we haven't seen from Jim Beam. Uh, so that would be kind of cool to taste. So winter reserve. I'm kind of down on the proof, though. Only 86. This is... This will be right up there or, you know, right around like where what we see with their, um, you know, like the, the Jim Beam Double Oak. I am very eager to try the new Jim Beam Black label. That's the uh, has the seven year age statement on it. So that one's coming out soon. I think it's already hit some places. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting my hands on that one, too. But uh, yeah, sell your house. Can't drink. Let's see. Sell your house. Can't drink a house. <laughs> If you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate you checking out my GoFundMe to help pay for some medical bills not covered by insurance. Um, oh, yes, guys. Fifth Quarter Tailgate has been going through. So that is Scott. Uh, great channel. He's been going through some uh, some hardship as, uh, as of late health-wise. He was in a facility trying to get his uh, health back on track. And unfortunately, he had to come home. But I don't think when he was fully ready to go home. So um, he's got a bunch of medical bills right now that's not being covered. So if you guys want to click that link in the chat and uh, drop fifth, fifth quarter tailgate a little help. That would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, God. Thanks for the reminder there. Um, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Anyone have you seen the new Michter's 10-year bourbon drop yet? Yeah, so that was another bottle that was announced. Uh, Michter's did announce the next 10-year bourbon for 2024. Um, so I haven't seen it drop yet. I'm hoping uh, I get a bottle from Michter's soon. It's going to be hard to follow the 2023, man. I'll tell you that. Ah, uh, man. But we'll see. I mean, those barrels that were aging in 2023 that they kind of pushed, you know, are they, did they let some more sit out for the 10 year? You know, who knows? So we'll see what that looks like. Um, as if we needed a Basil Hayden's alternative. <laughs> oh, I didn't even like think of it that way. Oh my God. Uh, Beam Black, seven year, 19, duck, 19 bucks in Lexington. Damn, you know who buys 49 year old 55,000? Arthur Blank. Oh, yeah, his 180 million yacht was in town this week at the port of Savannah. He laughs at you being a Falcons fan, says James Lake. <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> oh, man. Hope you heal up. Uh... <laughs> let's see here. Uh, let's see, just making sure I kind of finish up here. So I don't know if anybody uh, saw a story that came out about Maker's Mark releasing a rye whiskey. Anybody catch that? Well, that was an April Fool's joke. They're not releasing a rye whiskey. So if anybody got really excited that Maker's Mark is releasing a rye whiskey, April Fool's, the joke is on you. Um, it was on me for a bit because I got a little excited. I'm like, whoa, Maker's Mark is making rye. I got a little excited until I read the whole press release. And I was like, oh, that's, that's an April Fool's joke. Yeah, that one got me for a second. That one, that one kind of got me. Uh, what's the still Austin news? Yeah, let me let me pull this up. 
Uh, let me see here. Um, so the, the rumor was is that still Austin is going to be moving to Lexington. And I was wondering if that was also an April Fool's joke. I don't think it's true. Um, so if anyone, uh, let me see here. Yeah, I don't think that was true. So if, if that's what people are referring to, I don't think that's a true statement. Um, uh, let's see. People bitching about barrel shortages and then using all these toasted barrels. Yeah, Eric, I mean, toasted barrels are popular. It's a thing. I could see why people are using it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but uh, still not Austin. Yeah, it was fake news, Christopher David. Yeah, Austin, I, I, I don't see how still Austin becomes the pinnacle of Texas whiskey. With their name still Austin, I moved to Kentucky. It made no sense. So uh, that was also fake news. <laughs> yeah, April Fool's joke also. And I forgot where I saw that. That came out somewhere. Still Austin's moving to Kentucky to be immediately part of the bourbon trail. Yeah, that's not happening either. So, all right. All right, so while I'm sipping this, let's go through your, your viewers, the bourbons we're not buying. Your results, these were, again, all the comments I went through. I went through about 430, 440-something comments that everybody left. They weren't all like, you know, all the comments weren't necessarily around, you know, what bottles they're not buying, but a lot of them were, uh, a lot of them were, and some of them were just comments on the video. So, so we're going to go through the list. If you guys did not see my video, bourbons I'm not buying anymore, I kind of laid out a bunch of different bottles that, you know, just don't have my attention anymore. There were some controversial ones, Weller Foolproof I had on the list, Rock Hill Farms I had on the list. Smoke Wagon, 1792 foolproof, uh, anything from Kentucky Owl, Woodford Reserve, special releases. There was a whole list. I probably could have kept going, to be honest, but I had to stop somewhere. Uh, so we're going to go through the list here. So a little bit of a drum roll because, yeah, we're about to reveal this list here. So here we go. There's the list. Bourbons we're not buying anymore. Here is the crowd source list, guys. 39,000 views, approaching 40,000 views here, uh, you know, up and coming on the video, which is great. So thank you all for support on that. 454 comments total. Um, so let's, let's go through the list here because there are a couple of brands here I did not mention that people, these were the most voted on. Now, I'll, I'll say this. There were some outliers where people just kind of mentioned once or twice. But the ones on this list were, were mentioned probably two times or more. So that's kind of where I wanted to pull these in from the uh, from the comments. So first one, Whistle Pig. Not surprised there. Whistle Pig tends to have very high prices. And they, especially like, like the jump from the 12-year, you know, rye whiskey to the 15, just three years more, is a couple hundred dollars. It's a big jump. It's not like a little menial you know, it's an extra 50 or extra hundred dollars. It's a big jump in price point. Then you get up to the boss hogs. I get it. But whistle pig has always been on the high end of pricing strategies. They, you know, with boss hog, they have come out and said that they want to kind of curtail the whole, you know, whiskey black market thing. That's why they price it so high, which I think does work to a certain extent. But I also think it kind of takes away from some of the other whiskeys that they have. I've been part of uh, one barrel pick for the state of Ohio with the whistle pigs. And as much as I did like their whiskeys, the price points were just way too much. Um, so let's go through the next one here. New Riff. New Riff got mentioned more than a couple times, which totally, that was pretty surprising. Um, now, I have been critical of New Riff's bourbon single barrels because they, they're they really up and down for me. Um, I've had a lot of ones that are not so great. And then I've had a lot of them that are kind of young and bitter and youthful. Their rye whiskeys are fantastic. I think New Riff just absolutely kills it with their rye whiskeys. I did enjoy their American single malt. I think they're doing great things there. And I think they do such amazing things with their heritage grain series that they put out. They, they put out a few different ones and I can't, you know, always remember what they're called, but especially like the Balboa rye. And then they did the, um, the uh what was it the red wheat one that they did and now they're now they're using some more heritage grains as they go forward 
I'm excited to see what Newark is doing. If you're just talking about the bourbons, I could see maybe where you'd get, you know, a little bit jaded there. Uh, but I, you know, New Riff, I think is killing it for what, what they're, what they're kind of coming out with. So I'm, I'm not necessarily think I'm on board with New Riff. Uh, let's go to the next one. Old Scout. Uh, I mean, I could see some people getting a little bit burned out with Old Scout because those old MGP single barrels that we used to get are all gone. Um, so yeah, I mean, I could get that to a certain point, but I've still had some pretty stellar Old Scout single barrels. So I think it just depends on what you buy. Um, all right, let me go here to, well, let me throw the ticker on so you guys can get your news. Uh, let's go to the next one here. Uh, Old Carter. Old Carter is, is tough because I absolutely, you know, love Mark and Sherry and what they've done and what they've built. But I think they're, uh, I, I think the blends, their use of Tennessee whiskey, you know, and obviously I think more than anything, it's really the price points that they utilize, you know, being 200 and above, but it is to, it is kind of a luxury type of brand. I mean, you got to remember they're coming off of Carter wines which have a ton of, uh, which is an expensive red wine. So why not kind of, you know, turn that into the whiskey? Um, so I think Old Carter being up there wasn't a surprising list that I, you know, a surprising selection that I saw on the, on the list. But I don't know. I, I think that it's, it's tough. It's tough. I, you know, for them to really stay, you know, interested, or I should say stay in the minds of whiskey geeks, I do feel like they have to, I don't know, if they could drop the price a little bit. I mean, for $200 of what you get, and I feel like you just need to be a little bit more competitive if you can. Uh, next one up, Elmer T. Lee. That's not surprising. As soon as kind of the Buffalo Trace merry-go-round started, a lot of people were calling out Elmer T. Lee. As you can see on the right, on the middle column, down there on the bottom, Hancock's was mentioned as well. Um, Henry McKenna on there. And I, uh, I hope my mother's not watching cause she's going to be like, who wrote Henry McKenna? They're going to, they're dead to me. Henry McKenna is the best burger ever. Forget it. Who wrote that comment? Delete it. I hate them. I hate them people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my mother. That's my mother, uh, yelling about Henry McKenna. So, um, yeah. Uh, old car did well in yesterday's age of bourbon says John Bornick. What happened to Sam Houston? Uh, Sam Houston, I think, you know, just kind of fell by the wayside because of the, the barrels that they had to work with. I'm not sure if Sam Houston's ever coming back, but remember Sam Houston is owned by the same company that also does, um, uh, Calumet and a lot, and you know, a few other brands. So, and we haven't seen a new Calumet and we haven't really seen Calumet seems to be putting out more of the uh, lower age stated bottles lately. I think there's an eight and a 10 year I've seen in the store and there's still 15s and 14s, you know, sitting around out there. Uh, so yeah. And 16s, right? Yeah. yeah. There's been a bunch. Uh, old Carter retail pricing keeps things on the shelf and more accessible, except there are stores making it up double the market. Itself. Yeah. I, I mean, it's already expensive. I don't think old Carter is worth, you know, paying the markups anymore, but I think for certain bottles, they're American whiskeys. I still love when they do their American whiskeys, but yeah, Henry McKenna, you can't say Henry McKenna because people are going crazy for it. So, uh, or my mother, my mother goes crazy for it and she's trying to get a job with, uh, Connor Driscoll to pick barrels. <laughs> uh, let's see. Elijah Craig toasted. Um, I don't know. I felt like that bottle to be on the list was fine, but I mean, it's a nice price point. If you want to try something toasted, you know, for me, I'm just not really a toasted guy as you guys know. So for that, for, you know, for that reason, for me, I was kind of, you know, lukewarm on that, but I do think it's a decent price point. I do think that bottle gets a little bit better as it opens up, but overall, it's, I don't think it's the I don't know. I can, I could take her to leave it. Garrison brothers. Uh, we had a few, few call outs for Garrison brothers. That is a say what you want a popular Texas whiskey. I think a lot of people do not like the prices of it. Some people don't like the really earthy flavors and the, and the Oak punch that it has. Some people love it. It's kind of a love it or hate it whiskey, but I think the price point again is what kind of, you know, people are seem to be falling back on, which makes total sense. Uh, now we get some good stuff. So Remus Repeal Reserve. <sighs> like I could see it. Like I could see Remus being kind of a letdown. And this is the problem. 
I think they really shot themselves in the foot with batch five. Batch five was such an amazing value for the for the age whiskeys that you have that anything after that, six and seven, were just meh compared to it. Now we have Ian Sturzman here, and he was uh he was pretty confident that the next couple batches uh they were looking to improve upon. Um and and yeah, I I'm curious to see what the next batch is gonna be like, but I think to write off Remus after two batches after five is tough. Remember, guys, and I always say it, five was an anniversary batch. Not everybody uh, knew that, and that's why they put a, a, you know, a good amount of age into those barrels. So, so it's like now that's what everybody expects, and I just don't think you could do that for every release. And I do think that if you think about it, um, you know, maybe they were saving some of their older stocks for the Volstead series and uh, some of the other higher-aged uh, whiskeys that they may be planning on. Wink, wink. So just saying. I, I get it, though. I get it. Remus uh, 6 and 7 are stinkers. Uh, so much great 9, 10-year MGP out there, better than Remus Repeal Reserve. Yeah, and I also think that's the other problem that Remus has. It's the fact that it's bottled at 100 proof, and then you have multiple other people that source from MGP, such as this beautiful bottle here, this Barrel King. That's half the price. Uh, I'm sorry, not half the price. That's more proof and has a bigger flavor punch than the Remus does. And it, it again, it goes to like you're you're almost competing against yourself, unfortunately. And I think that's kind of the issue we talked about with Ian as well. Um, they are trying to differentiate themselves. We'll see what comes down the pipeline with them. Um, Jason Coates says they would have been fine after batch five if they dropped back to 11, 12 year, not seven year. Jason, I totally agree. Like, make it a little bit gradual. Don't just cut it all the way back down, you know, where the youngest whiskey was, you know, seven years coming down from 11, 12. And wasn't there like 13, 14 stuff in there? I think it, there was some really old whiskey in five. So, yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. Bartstown Discovery. This one got mentioned a lot. And, you know, I think Bartstown Bourbon Company, I listen, you guys know that I'm one of the biggest fans of Bartstown, what they're doing. I love their collab finishes. I love their, their blends. Um, and then somebody kind of like called me out on it. They're like, Hey, why, you know, why wouldn't you have anything from Bartstown? Like, how do you, you know, how do you like that stuff? You, you know, you can't like all of it. And, and, you know, to that, to some extent, I think because I just always like to try interesting whiskey. Um, you know, I don't know. That's kind of that's kind of a good question. If Bardstown Discovery Series was every single blend was the same, but they were using either 12-year MGP or 15-year Jim Beam, you know, and every single blend was the same, would you still buy it every single time they released it? Or... Remember, Bartstown Discovery is is about the uh, you know the blending of different types of uh, of barrels and types of mash bills and different types of barrels from different areas. That's really what it's for. And I think the whiskey curious gets the you know the bourbon curious people really like to try what they've created. You know, some are good, some are bad. But again, we always like to go back to you know batches one through four, even yeah one through four, which were absolute monsters but they just don't have that whiskey to work with anymore so you know danny over at bartstown he's he's working with what what he can work with and trying to create stuff that's different and unique and whether you want to pay for it i mean we could argue that 130 bucks is a little bit much to pay for a uh for maybe a blend that's a bit experimental and i get that but when you when you really look at it i mean that's what they're trying to do with that series so, you know, from then on, I mean, maybe try before you buy it, but look what happened, look what happened with the last discovery series with all the, you know, the wild turkey in it. People went crazy for that batch with, for good reason. So I feel like discovery is kind of like, um, Elijah Craig barrel proof at this point where you're going to have some gems and you're going to have some ones that are, you know, not going to be your favorite, but to completely write it off. I don't think I'm there yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, Bartstown Discovery is what Blood Oath should be. 
Oh, dude, that's a good call out. That's a really good call out, actually. Like, I feel like Blood Oath is a combination of what Discovery is and the dis and also the Bart Sound collabs. Like, it's like those two kind of mesh together, where you play with some different ages, some different mash bills, but then you throw kind of a funky finish on it. Collaboration. I mean, yeah. Yeah, batch number three, but those days are over. Yeah, exactly, Brian. I totally agree with you. Yeah, again, I think I think price, Terrence, to your point, price is really what's driving a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, their entire purpose is to create unique experiences and offerings. Exactly. And if you don't want to pay for that, that is fine. That is up to you. But I'm always going to be one to try the, the newest Discovery series because I've had more great ones than not so great ones. So. And I understand people don't want to see the dickle in the in the one. It's kind of a huge turnoff. That's what everybody was writing. I'm not paying $130 for a 17-year-old dickle in my in my in my blend. Listen, this is what happens when you have to buy older whiskey to replace those older whiskeys you had back when you first started, but you don't have anymore. You have to figure out a way to replace those types of profiles. So unfortunately, 17-year-old dickle came in the mix. Uh, Joseph Magnus Cigar Blend, that is not a surprise. I kind of expected that one because it just seems like they are releasing a lot of them. Uh, they're already in the 200s. Like the bat, I feel like it went from like batch 58 all the way to like batch 200 really quick and beyond. And obviously, you know, maybe the whiskey isn't as old as it used to be. Somebody had written, uh, you're paying 225 bucks or whatever it may be for a bourbon that you hope is a good batch because... You can always go off of Nancy Fraley's uh, tasting notes. And I always tell people, if you're going to spend the money on a Joseph Magnus cigar batch, read Nancy's tasting notes because they are very, very different. I say all the time, just because you get one and you're happy to get it, it doesn't mean it's going to taste like the one that your, buddies ha that your buddy has. That's a different batch. They're, they're just different animals. You have to know what you're buying. Like, Nancy posts tasting notes. Now, I will say this. Nancy doesn't always post the ones that are coming out immediately. So you have to, sometimes it is a roll of dice. But I, I could see their point to that to that fact. Um, ages are coming up on the base whiskey for Joseph Max Cigar Blend. Easily found for $200 now here. I'm still a buy, says Nathan Jurgensen. Yeah, the base whiskey ages are coming out. So I still think there are good things to come from Joseph Max Cigar Blend. But again, just please... Try to read the tasting notes that are on just Google Joseph Magnus cigar batch blend number, and then see if that number is available to read because you can get a good indication of what it may taste like before you spend the money. Uh, Nancy also said that after batch 253. Yep. What about the batches that had no notes? That's the thing, Brad Tanica. If they don't have any notes on it, you're kind of rolling the dice, unfortunately. They just don't always catch up. Uh, or, you know, Nancy, Nancy's very busy. She just doesn't always have time to write up the tasting notes. So, you know, sometimes if you find that batch that there are no notes for it, unfortunately, you're kind of rolling the dice a little bit. 480 watching. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate everyone watching tonight. Please hit that like button below. Uh, really appreciate it, guys. It really helps with the, uh, the channel. And I did hit 89,000 subscribers, uh, a couple days ago. So thank you to you. I only have 11, uh, 11,000 left till I hit maybe uh, the milestone here for uh, 2024. Really hoping I'm hitting that milestone here for 100,000 subscribers. So please uh, please help continue to grow the channel, guys. I really appreciate all support. Love all of you. Seriously. All right. Next up is Woodenville. Not a big surprise here. I feel like Woodenville has gotten even more hot and cold with a lot of bourbon drinkers. Um, so I don't know. You guys let me know in the comments what you think about Woodenville. Is that one still a buy? I do like the finishes that Woodenville's been doing lately, especially the port finish, uh, but more the cast strength ones if you could find them. Uh, Booker's, that's one was not a surprise. Everyone's like, why is Booker's not on this list? Why is Booker's not on this list? You got to remember, guys, if you've heard my story before, Booker's was the bourbon that made me fall in love with bourbon. That was the one that sent me down the rabbit hole. So for me to write it off, I don't know if I could quite do that yet. I will say I'm more selective in the bookers that I buy. Um, if it's if I hear it's a really good batch versus a not so great batch, I'm all about it. But for me, I still can't write it off yet because it kind of holds a special place in my heart. I think we all have whiskeys like that, though. I mean, what what's the whiskey that made you love whiskey? And are you guys still kind of nostalgic about it, or have you just kind of like put it to the side? I don't know. Unless like the whiskey you fell in love with was like I don't know. 
you know, Blanton's or something. <laughs> oh, get it. Uh, oh, speaking of Blanton's, I'm actually shooting a very interesting video tomorrow. Details to come. Details to come. Uh, here we go. Let's uh, talk about Master's Keep. This was purely priced. Uh, this was purely a price aspect. A lot of, I, I think there were about seven or eight comments that said, I'm not only just Master's Keep, but I'm not buying a lot of turkey products because of the price increases. And this saddens me so much because you guys know I'm a wild turkey super freak. And um, the fact that so many people were writing off Master's Keep was, I don't know, I guess a surprise, but not a surprise. When you're talking about Master's Keep getting up to $300 when it used to be $130, $140, and, and, and at that time, those were older whiskeys, I could see the trepidation and, and kind of, you know, keeping Master's Keep at arm's length for a lot of people. It's just the way it goes. Um, just to remember your early lives with 40 people uh, in it, and now it's 400. <laughs> yeah, I... I, I love I love all those uh, those lives. Is Dom back? Yeah, it could be. I could be finally visiting Dom's fabled basement, my my personal hell of uh, his Blanton's museum down in his basement. The thing though is Dom has a very unique bottle of Blanton's. We're gonna try, and we're gonna film it tomorrow. I think, and um, should be interesting. And I think it might be one you guys are gonna want to tune in for. So we're gonna be recording that. Um, it saddens me because I can't find it for anything um, less than secondary. Yeah, Brian, but I feel like even if Blanton's did send you down the rabbit hole, I feel like it's still like a love for that bottle that, you know, you may have. I mean, you may not go out and chase it, but it might be one of those bottles that if you see it at retail or a good price, you're going to pick it up because it's the bottle that made you love bourbon. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as, a huge, well, as a huge turkey head and price is reason I'm passing on Master's Keeps, says Peter B., um, Martel says, I know what this video is. Um, 130 great, 130 great, 300 for a rum finished 10 year old bourbon is a tough sell. I know it was good, but dang. See, I didn't think it was, I think it was the best rum finished bourbon I've had, but I didn't think it was anything great. Um, please say hi to Clayton. He's watching and a huge fan, uh, says Casey house. Cheers, Clayton. What's going on, man? Nice to, uh, thanks for watching. Jason C will be a bullet in a Blanton's shop. Yeah, I might. Uh, <laughs> so let's look at the rest of the list here. Old Forester Barrel Proof. That one came up. That one almost made my list, but I decided to keep it off because I don't know. I, I feel like it would have been, um, I would have been contradicting myself because I literally just bought one like at the Old Forester gift shop like a month ago. So I was like, oh, I haven't had one in a while. This one is at the Old Forester gift shop. This one has to be good, right? It actually ended up being pretty good, but I get it. Old Forester Battle Proof is, they're only four to five years normally. They're heat cycled warehouses. So I can get that little bit of like an aspartame note here and there. I'll know sometimes they drink really hot sometimes. And, you know, it's just like one of those things where I honestly rather have the 100 proof ones because I think, you know, to go back way back to what Jackie Zykin said when she was with Old Forester, Old Forester tastes better at a lower proof. More of the fruit flavors and the esters come out in it. And it's just a better overall product. I agree. However, with that said, I do not want to see birthday bourbon for less than 100 proof ever. And I know that happens still. But if you're going to ask people to spend all that money and wait online and do all this crazy shit for birthday bourbon, you better put a little proof on it. That's all I'm saying. And this year, 12-year age statement, 107 proof on this year's birthday bourbon. Yeah, I might be trying to get that one. I doubt I will, but I might be trying. So we'll see what happens. Uh, all right. Let's see. Hancock's. That was kind of an easy call out for uh, from a Buffalo Trace standpoint. You never really hear about that bourbon again being like an 86 proof bourbon. Um, here are the most surprising ones on the right side get there, guys. Wild Turkey Rare Breed. Wild Turkey Rare Breed was a big surprise. Russell's Reserve 13 was a big surprise. And so was E.H. Taylor. Um, I think Russell's Reserve 13. I did not agree with that at all. I think the price, that was based solely on the price point of Russell Reserve 13 now going up to, you know, 250, 300 bucks, whatever it is now. Wild Turkey Rare Breed really surprised me. And this had nothing to do with price. People were saying that Rare Breed lately has tasted different and not what it used to be. And, you know, I got to say, I'm not going to say I fully agree with that. 
But there's a part of me that agrees with that statement because I bought a new bottle of Rare Breed and I put it in a blind tasting just to kind of test how good it was and it didn't fare well. It When you go to Wild Turkey and you taste some blind barrels or just, you know, not blind barrels, but if you taste them right out of the cask, there are certain barrels at Wild Turkey that hold this very, very heavy, heavy cinnamon type flavor that's like borderline Amburana. And anytime I come across those, it's like, yeah, no, this one's not for me. This isn't, this doesn't have that turkey balance that I'm used to. Um, and the last bottle of Rare Breed that I tried had that profile in it. So it's like those barrels that maybe aren't being chosen for the single barrel program are getting dumped into Rare Breed. And I think it's kind of overtaking the profile. At least that's my theory. Because a lot of the barrels that I've tried that have that profile have been ones that I know have not been picked uh, for single barrels. So. I don't know. It's it's a theory, but something did change at Rare Breed. Now, I know they do different batches. Hopefully, it gets back on track. We'll see what happens. But I think that's just solely based on that, not so much the price point. Let's look at the most defended down on the bottom there. 1792 Foolproof got the most defended uh, you know, comments. People saying 1792 Foolproof isn't dead yet. Highly disagree. You got to try some more picks. These are great values, 50 bucks amazing uh bourbons for the money people were really coming to bat for 1792 foolproof um then you have will it rye will it rye i think people still love i mean again that's more of a flavor profile type thing i've just never been a huge will it person uh but there are a lot of people defending will it rye that really enjoy will it rye still and well or foolproof i called it out and you know people went you know i'm not gonna say they went nuts there were a lot of people that were on board with me that said yeah well or foolproof is one of the most overrated uh, weeded bourbons on the planet. Much rather drink um, Weller Antique over Weller Foolproof, and I could totally see that. Um, I've always enjoyed Weller Antique. I think Weller Antique is one of the most finely crafted weeded bourbons on the planet. Absolutely love. I think the price point is perfect. The flavors are great. Weller Foolproof to me, every time I've had one, it's either been just a solid bourbon, uh, mediocre bourbon, but I can't say – I've only had maybe one or two that I was like, wow, that is incredible. So I don't know. It, it just I, just I think it's just like luck of the draw of what you get. If you had one of the best single barrels in the world and that's like your whis best whiskey you've ever tasted, I could see why you would defend it. But for me, my specific experience at Weller Foolproof has been less than impressive. So, But that's, but that's me. Uh, I also have stopped the Weller foolproof 1792 is a hot mess in my opinion. I mean, I think there's some truth to that, but at the same time, there are a lot of people that do get incredible, incredible types of, uh, aspects to Weller foolproof and they, they really love it. And 1792 foolproof for that matter. I think you've got to know who's picking it and you got to get lucky when you find a single barrel of 1792. Uh, 518 in the chat. Holy crap. Thank you so much for uh, for tuning in tonight, everybody. Uh, make Weller budget again. Yeah, I mean, Weller foolproof store picks at MSRP. Uh, I have never had a Weller foolproof that was better than any ASW Georgia Hartwood. Love 1792 foolproof picks. Great value. I love Barstown Discovery, but it's way overpriced. Uh, the Weller foolproof I had was a shell for sample. Honestly, I thought it was great. 107 is batch. Uh, 107 is batch A. So guessing Weller foolproof is as well. Oh, batch proof. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not sure what that means. Uh, Noah scares of fact says, "What's up? What's going on, man? One of the best whiskey. One of the best whiskey I have owned is 1792 proof. Yeah. So a lot of people were saying that that some of the best things that they have were some 1792 foolproofs. I gotta find these bottles because I can't seem to run into a good 1792 foolproof bottle. Uh, but yeah. But Will It Rye, yep, defended. And then also on top of that, you had the uh, uh, Weller Foolproof, which was also pretty well defended. So no big surprises there except for, you know, maybe because I just live in like this, I love wild turkey bubble, but a lot of people kind of hating on turkey. But I think that was mostly driven by prices. So there you go. Drinking 1792 Sweet Weed right now. It's good, but it's too light for what I'm wanting, says Jake Parsons. That's my issue with 1792 Sweet Wheat. The more you sip it, the more it just turns into water. There's just like nothing to it. Like I don't, I don't understand. Um, I had a 17. Nathan Jurgensen, Turkey has amazing prices. Yeah, if you're talking about boar's head turkey, 
not like Wild Turkey. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, if you talk about Wild Turkey 101, Russell, oh, Russell's tenure. Was that on the list? Because that one came up too. Did we talk about Russell's tenure? Uh, no, that one, that one didn't make it. Uh, I, I guess I forgot to uh, put that one in there. Russell's tenure was the other turkey product that people said they're not buying anymore. They said it's too soft. It's too easy. Something changed. Doesn't have the depth that it used to have for a 10 year old bourbon. I would agree with that a little bit. The last Russell's tenure I had was not up to snuff from what I'm, from what I remember. So, you know, listen, distillers all the time go through ebbs and flows, especially wild Turkey when you're kind of batching different products together. It is what it is. So, uh, 99% of what they make is priced amazing. Yeah, I, I totally get it, Nathan. Absolutely. Back to your earlier question. Lagavulin introduced me to loving whiskey. Mash and Drums Review Rare Breed is what introduced me to bourbon worth drinking, says Eddie D. Yeah. I, I Listen, I'm always going to buy turkey and support turkey. Yeah, unless they change the prices of Rare Breed and Russell's Reserve single barrel to like over $100, then, you know, maybe, maybe then I'll start protesting. But right now, those are probably still the number... Those are probably the main bourbons that I purchased, to be honest. Um, the last rare breed I had was not up to par. I was shocked. So, David Schweibold, did you get like that heavy cinnamon thing that I'm talking about that I got? Because that seems to be the consensus of people that I talk to. So, I'm feeling like Turkey is trying to go sweeter and lighter to compete with Buffalo Trace, but they need to go back to their roots. Terrence McDermott, I could not agree more. Even while Turkey 101 has lost its bite. That I love. It's it's gotten a little bit sweeter, a little bit easier to drink. And I know I'm not crazy because I still compare it to some of the older bottles of Wild Turkey 101 that do have that bite. So I'm just like kind of wondering if they're leaning towards a different profile or if it the flavor is just driven by the barrels and they're just trying to make it like Conor Driscoll said um, a couple weeks ago, you know, the flavor profiles are driven by the barrels. So all right, I've been yapping long enough. Let's get into some whiskey here. So Glens Creek Distilling sent me a whole mess of samples. I'm not going to drink all these because I do want to get into this uh, this really cool blind tasting that was given to me um, by one of my viewers, good friend of mine. He's like, I got a fun blind for you. I was like, okay, I got to get back into blind tasting. So uh, I haven't done them a lot lately. I got to you know get back into it. Got to get my palate back into like you know testing out all these different types of bourbons. I think my schedule's been crazy. I just haven't been able to. Uh, you know, get into my blinds, which I love to do. And I will be, uh, you know, you know, going through all these tonight and trying to guess proof. And I don't know if I'm going to try to guess distillery, but I'll do my best here. So time to get wild turkey on the show, Jason. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm working on it, man. Uh, just cracked my black and rye. The lightning says MJ. I really like it. Beautiful pour. Okay. I like that one. So MJ it's beautiful color and creamy texture. It's really good. So there's your first endorsement for Black and Rye the Lightning. All right, so here we go. David Meyer, owner and head distiller at Glens Creek Distilling. Thanks for tasting our bourbons and giving your honest review. I enjoy your channel and your candor. P.S. I didn't want you to open the envelope because I don't want I don't want you to be biased by age statements. So I did not open the envelope. So here it is. So let's let's see what we got here. So he sent me seven different products i'll i'll go through four of them let's try four and some of these look dark like really really dark so uh so i'll let's see here so this one's sample amazing so amazing so a m a i z e dash i n g okay Now, if you guys aren't unfamiliar, if you're unfamiliar with Glens Creek, do you guys know the the, the bottles that uh, say OCD on them? The OCD bottles. I'll see if I could pull up a pull up a photo of one uh, for you guys. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if I could grab one of these to pull up. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. There's one of them. So let me throw this here in the chat and see if you guys have seen this one. Um, all right, so here's what the bottles look like. So this is one of them. This is the OCD number five, Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey. So if you guys have seen these bottles, um, that's that's what they look like. Uh, at least 
I think that's what most of them look like. I don't know if there's other any special bottlings here, but I'll do that one. This one says premium barrel number eight. We're definitely going to try that one. Um, what's this one? Uh, yeah, that's 102 proof. Maybe not. Let's see. That's 100 proof. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, let's see. Quer, Quervito Vivo. Well, that sounds interesting. I'm just trying to pick the interesting ones here. Uh, oh, another premium. This is number seven. Is this also a premium? Number eight. All right. So we're going with the two premiums here. And what is this last one? Just for... Oh, this one's called Cafe Olay. That sounds like coffee. Maybe I shouldn't drink that one before a blind. So we're going to stick with these four here first. So let's see what we get. Uh, so this is the Quer Vito Vivo. Let me go back to the uh, the chat here. Glens Creek, fantastic distillery, putting out great whiskey, says Gandy Road. All right, well, we're going to find out here. Uh, and as usual, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, if I don't see them, throw me a super chat. Uh, Daniel Brinley says, oh, I'm excited for these. And this we have the premium barrel number eight. Okay. Unfortunately, the proofs are written on here. I kind of wish they weren't, but whatever. We'll, uh, we'll kind of go. Oh man, that looks dark. Oh my God. It looks like Coca-Cola. Ooh, that is cloudy too. Look at that. It looks like. Coke sitting in the class. That is dark. All right, we'll try that one. And again, I, I don't know the ages of these at all. So I'm guessing uh, they might be younger. That has a little bit more of a, you know, I, I have no idea about these guys. So we'll try this. And then we'll get into the uh, blind tasting right after. So, but in the meantime, uh, also, before I forget, I do want to mention that, um, Match and Journey Whiskey Club, we just released our Peerless Barrels last week, and we had a good amount that made it through Patreon because there were so many bottles because uh, there was three different barrels, and the short barrel that we had, which is gone, which is this one, the Ghost Barrel, actually, that one sold out immediately because uh, everyone likes the short barrels, uh, but we have like 20 bottles of the Bigfoot Bourbon left, so this is the Bigfoot Bourbon from Peerless. Um and the reason why we kind of call these after like monsters that are missing is because these barrels were actually missing for almost two years. So we have the Bigfoot bourbon and we have the Loch Ness hide and go rye. These are absolutely fantastic uh, single barrels. And if none of you have had anything stellar from Peerless, now might be a good time. So I'll actually uh, throw the, uh, the link in the chat. And if you guys want to grab a bottle, there's some available. So have at it. Um, all right. All right, let's let's try this. Uh, what do we got here? Let's try the amazing CO, the amazing COB, 107.4 proof. Let's see what we get here. And let's see if there's like a distinct, uh, distinct like flavor profile that we're kind of running through here. Terrence McDermott. Yeah, they were so they weren't missing, they were around, but what oh man, that smells good. Uh, but what happened was is that Peerless was going through a distributorship change in between the uh, between when they picked our barrels and before we got them, and they were going through such a legal battle that our barrels sat there for like another for almost a year and a half. So we knew where they were, kind of, but we couldn't get them to our patrons. So, um, Kenneth Rathburn, I was eyeballing the Peerless picks. What would you compare them to? Uh, I don't know, Kenneth. These 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 barrels are pretty concentrated because these were kind of like makeup barrels. But this Peerless Rye is, um, I would probably compare to. I don't know. It's a Kentucky Rye. It's six and a half years old. It's barrel proof. I don't know. Like maybe like a more viscous, like Pikesville type of profile. Oh, only the Loch Ness Rye is available now. Oh, okay. So the Bigfoot's gone. So the Rye's available, though, guys. If you guys want to try to get the Loch Ness Rye, have at it. Are they still doing free shipping on three private picks? That was a good deal. Yeah, as far as I know, JG. Holy crap. All right, so I 
God, this tastes like this tastes like straight up molasses and chocolate. That is crazy dark. Um, that's the amazing. Jesus. Jason, kind of off topic. I'm usually with you on flavor profile, but the Woodford. Uh, what about Woodford? Uh, Daniel Brindley, no. Well, they were they were bottled. I don't know. We keep getting like conflicting reports. Like somebody said that they were bottled like two months after we selected them, but then somebody said they were still in the barrel when they were at the distillery when they saw them. So I don't I don't know what the truth is, to be honest. I think there could be up to like six months. Uh, who knows? Yeah, Kenneth, that might be a good way to do because it, it is citrusy. So more kind of like that Bart Sound dry with like that that barrel proof, like you know, Thomas H. Handy characteristic. All right, so here's the thing with the amazing. Um, I don't know if, if the name is kind of setting it off for me, but it does bring me like vibes of um, there is a very sweet caramel corn cracker jack thing going on. Uh, it's got like this almost like burnt caramel type taste. So I'm trying to like guess like, is this a younger whiskey? Is it double oaked? Is it toasted? Is there kind of some kind of stave profile coming in on it? Uh, stave edition, which, which is what I'm thinking because it, it has some youthful characteristics. However, I love the dark profile that I'm getting on the back end of it though. Oh, John said, oh, this is 100% corn. Okay, that makes sense then. Yeah, I mean, it's very corn forward. You could definitely get that right away. Um, but yeah, this is a deep, this is, it's Cracker Jack to me in a glass with a little bit, not so much covered with caramel, but covered with like a burnt caramel molasses like type of flavor profile. I mean, I dig it. I can I can get into that one. Um, okay. John Legalvo says uh, toasted barrel. Okay, so we have a so it is toasted. So there you go. I knew it had to be something in there because I was getting that flavor that I was getting on the back end. All right, so it's good to know that my palate still works pretty well. <laughs> you always gotta like double check your palate. Yeah, there's something happening here. It's toasted. Okay, got it. Yeah, dude, that like molassesy caramel corn like type of note on it that goes into a little bit of chocolate too. It's pretty delicious, I gotta say. Um, as that opens up though, I'd get a little bit scared of giving kind of like that toasted aspartame note, but we'll see. All right, let's try the Cuervito Vivo next. Um, oh, this is how you say it. Cuervito Vito. Cuervo, cu Cuervito Vito, Cuervito Vito. That's how you say it. I don't even know how to talk anymore. Woodford Barrel Proof versus Lesser Larceny val Barrel Proof. Um, tell Casey, tell Casey House hi for me. Says Clayton. <laughs> Are you guys just asking me to like go back and forth, say hi to each other? So hi, Casey. <laughs> yeah, my hand gestures are like totally like setting off the uh, the emojis. Oh, it's not doing it now. Oh, it did it. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Whiskey Nose is here. All right, let's go to this one here on the on the nose. This one, I'm also getting a little bit of a youthful characteristic to it. Little corn heavy. Not as dark, though, as the other one. Yeah, this one, I think I like the amazing a little bit better on the nose, at least. Um... This one is coming off a little bit brighter. This one's a little bit more of a brighter caramel type note. All right, let's try this one. Yeah, so that one to me needs more time. That one I'm getting a lot of youthful characteristic on it. Um, it's good. It's not great. I think it's got like this, um, man, what is that? Yeah, this one gives me almost like Texas whiskey vibes where there's a nice little oak spice there. I think the best thing about this one is the spice on it. 
However, it does have a youthful characteristic to it, which I'm not really digging. It's a little bit corn heavy. Um, I don't know if it's a yeah, yeah, is it it doesn't say there's a finish on it. Um Cuerva, Cuervito Vito. Maybe that is a tequila finish on it. I don't know. I picked up a 118.4 proof Woodford from last year based off Jason Review. And dang, is it good? Didn't steer me wrong. Dude, that's my favorite Woodford right there. Woodford 2023 barrel proof to me is a borderline undrinkable. Bad bottle. Am I missing something? Tastes like hot young whiskey and can't believe it's Minix number seven for 2023. Yeah, dude, I'm uh, I'm with you. I was not a big fan of Woodford 2023 batch proof at all. Um, I feel like I'm one of the few detractors of Woodford batch proof. I don't know why. I just Everybody seems to go crazy for it. I don't get it. I think it's just young whiskey masked in a pretty bottle. Um, with obviously some heat cycled warehousing in it. That's why we never get an age statement. But I will say that 118 proof from a couple of years ago was damn good. I just want to maybe get back to that profile. Uh, Quer Vito Vivo means live, live crow in English. Live crow. Yeah, I don't know if I'm feeling that one. Um, so far, I really like this amazing one. That one's, that's, I like that profile. Whenever you can give me like molasses in a in a glass, I'm all for it. This year's is not good, too youthful, says Russell Meyer. Yeah, it it's it smells like young whiskey. And I'm also getting, I'm starting to get a little bit of like a uh man, like that little weird like acetone note that I get sometimes on like the old foresters. I don't know. Not digging that one. All right. Let's get to the prime barrels here. OCD number five, premium barrel number eight. And then this one's number seven. Well, let's start with number seven. This one's 111 proof. Let's see what we got. Oh, that smells nice. Uh, King's family does great stuff, says James Lay, and they're good people. Woodford batch proof is a robbery. This year's is not good, too youthful. Yeah, I agree. I, I just don't think it's – I don't think this year's was that great uh, this year either. Oh, okay. So premium barrels is a little bit more of a refined type of whiskey here. Um, it's not nearly as corn forward as the other two were. And this one gives you a little bit of a more of like a refined type of flavor profile. I'm not getting a lot of youthful characteristic here. Maybe a, a, a tinge of it. Damn, that's good. Mm. Who said cola in the chat? That is like straight up Coca-Cola syrup in a glass with a little bit of spice, baking spice there too. It's kind of like this chocolate, deep, dark, rich cola note that I'm getting in that glass. That thing's crazy. That's good. I could drink that. That's pretty good. However, there's got, again... I'm getting that flavor on the back end. There's got to be some sort of double oaking, toasted type of thing going on with this because I'm getting that flavor. You just, I just feel like that's what it tastes like to me. Um, uh, Miss a great shot. Uh, thanks for bringing that up to Rebecca Creek. You will see a video for the Spanish oak pretty soon. I'm pretty excited. Next week, we'll, we will be uh, heading out. Master Journey Winston Club is heading out to Texas, to Austin. Uh, to pick some, speaking of Still Austin, we'll be there picking some barrels. And we're also going to be heading to Rebecca Creek to pick uh, a great barrel for the club too. So great time to be part of Mass and Journey. All right, let's go to the number eight here. Oh, number eight, guys. Okay. Number eight's got the butterscotch, baby. SLB talked about their premium bottles. There's something odd they do to create that, and that's why there are so few available. Um, yeah, I need to ask about what's in the. There's something going on with these barrels for sure. Whether it be a secondary barrel finish. All right. This one, though, I, I smell the butterscotch immediately. It smells like, uh, like cake in a glass. Oh, it's buttery. It's vanilla icing. 
I'm also getting like that, like that cream cheese type note a little bit, like Philadelphia cream cheese, where it's like, it just has like that tang to it. Have you had Found North 18 years, specifically Batch 7, amazing stuff? Love your content, says Reniculous. Um, I have, and it is amazing stuff. I think Found North is still one of the most overlooked brands on the market. People are sleeping on them, and I don't know why. They just uh, released the their their press release for their new uh, their new finished 18-year product coming out. I cannot wait for that. I'm on the email list, so hopefully I can get that one. Hey, Jason, well, a 12-year for $44 worth it. I was in a drawing through Total Wine and more. I was picked to buy this bottle. Bill Mills, for 44 bucks, hell yeah, it's worth it. A 12-year bourbon from, from Buffalo Trace for 44 bucks, yeah. And if you don't want to drink it, you can always trade something for it. People pay stupid money for Weller 12s. This one's my favorite, easily. This number eight. It is dark. It is buttery. It is the one thing I wish it had that it doesn't really have is a long finish. But if this had a longer, what's the proof on this one? 113.6. Damn. So this one was Coca Cola. This one is vanilla Coke in a glass. These two, these premium barrels are great. These two, I think, need a little bit more of a, you know, I didn't mind the amazing. I thought that was actually nice for 100% corn whiskey. Um, the Coervito Co 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 Vito Vivo, this one's a little bit too youthful for me. Um, but these two, these premium barrels are, I could see why they may be into the premium aspect of things. This thing is, is Coca-Cola and this is vanilla cola in a glass and it's delicious. Would you choose Rock Hill Farms or Penelope Rio if you had to choose the drinks of C.J. Miller? Dude, that's like the worst choice ever. <laughs> Honestly, though, I'd probably go Penelope Rio. I think Penelope Rio is a more interesting whiskey. Even though I don't like Amburana that much, the Penelope Rio is the one that I would lean towards because of that honey finish on it. And I think it's what makes it interesting. Rock Hill Farms doesn't really do anything for me. Premium is the OCD whiskey. They leave a little in the barrel when they are empty. It combine the remnants of several barrels into one and age long. Okay, so it's kind of like a Solera thing happening here. Uh, Jason, have you ever had any of the Critidens? Nope, can't say I had, Bob. They only produce one barrel of premium every year. Oh, wow, John. Okay. John, thank you for uh, giving me the info here. I didn't want to look at you know the envelope quite yet. But let's crack this open and find out a little bit more about these four whiskeys that we had. And then we'll get into our blind tasting here tonight to finish out the night. That should be entertaining since I haven't done a blind in a while. All right, premium. Oh, here we go. Premium barrel number eight. Um, 113.6 proof. Distilled, aged, and bottled at Glens Creek. So this is all produced in Glens Creek at, in Frankfurt. So kudos to that. This is only six years old. I definitely think it tastes older than that from, from the Solera. Uh, at the bottom of every barrel of our OCD is a deep mix of uh, charred wood and great bourbon. We reserve this small amount of very special bourbon and filter out the charcoal, which leaves an extra dark and smooth bourbon. Well, there you go. We bottle it at barrel strength so that you can enjoy the full flavor. We distill and age and carefully and urge you to enjoy it responsibly okay so six years old I, I would venture that that's a little bit i don't know maybe i would think that that's six because of the butterscotchiness it has um all right the next one is the okay let's talk about the amazing this one is let's see uh barrel number 10 distilled age bottle in kentucky at glens creek things don't always man these are long paragraphs sorry guys uh, what would happen if we use 100% corn in typical OCD fashion? We decided to give it a try to find out. It tastes good coming out of the still, so in the barrel it went. Um, yeah, the amazing to me. Now I don't see an age on here, so but this one isn't. This one isn't doing it. That was the one that really didn't do it for me. 
Um, I haven't tried that one. Uh, this is, I didn't try that one. All right, this is the Cuervito Vivo. When you are privileged to operate on the grounds, uh, let's see, we distill it. Okay, what is this? Age at least 39 months. Okay, yeah, that tastes a little older than 39 months. Um, oh, no, wait, that was the really young one. No, yeah, the Cuervito Vito tastes like it's 39 months. Yeah, that one's young. And then we have the Cafe Olay, uh, which we didn't try either. So, all right. These premium barrels, though, I'm I'm all about it. The premium barrel is freaking good. I love this uh, little butterscotchy one. Jason is a closet Amirana junkie. He just admitted it. <laughs> I am not a closet Amirana junkie. Okay. All right, guys. Well, thanks to uh, to Glens Creek for sending me these. Um, I'll be if uh, let me see here. Uh, David Meyer, if you're watching. Or if you see this later, I'll send you some detailed notes about each and every one. But these premium barrels are freaking delicious. So, um, yeah. And the fact they're only six years old, I think. This one, uh, this this barrel number seven, I feel like you could, you could if you told me that was like a nine or ten-year-old whiskey, I'd probably be up there with you. So, all right. Let's put these aside and let's get into this blind tasting and see how much I suck. <laughs> All right, so my buddy JD uh, gave me this uh, blind tasting, and he said uh, it should be fun. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six samples. All right. Uh, so we're gonna go from left to right here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. So. Obviously, I have no clue what's in here. Uh, he dropped these off and's like, here, this should be fun for you. So <laughs> here we are. Uh, and, and, and again, like I mentioned, blind tastings are something I haven't done a lot lately. Uh, so it'll be good to kind of get back into it here tonight with you guys live. And like I said, you guys can see how much I suck right now. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to have a little water here in between. Um, yeah, we'll see how we do. Uh, so he said that this is a really eclectic mix of whiskeys. So in my head, I'm thinking he's got a rye in here. He's got a bourbon. Maybe he's got a American whiskey, a light whiskey. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, maybe a blend. Uh, you know, I, I know one of them he uh, experimented with, and I'm going to have to see if I could pick that one out. So we'll see how it goes. All right, guys. All right, so this should be fun. Um, again, I haven't done this in quite a bit, <laughs> so let's, I, uh, I took out the old notepad. Uh, where is the, let's see here. Is my pen here? Oh, there it is. It's underneath. All right. All right. So I have my A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Well, it's, it's numbered, so I'll. I'll just kind of fix that. All right, guys, a little bit of water. All right, meet people's thoughts. Here we go. Stack 23B or 23C. What do you guys got? Dano says, late to the stream. How was Matt's BK blend? Matt's blend is stellar. I actually still have it here. Uh, kind of, oh, man, it's, it's good. It's really good. It's just got like this. This very fruit forward like type of flavor profile, it's it's good. I, I mean, I think what Matt did was actually pretty great. So um, I'm I'm curious to see how this bottle is going to even open up more over time. Uh, Danielle Fritches in the house just can't wait to hear your thoughts. Okay, all right, we'll see, we'll see how we do. All right, let's go to the first one here, guys. First blind tasting live in quite a while. So uh, wish me luck. And again, if you guys have any questions for me. Um, we'll, uh, we'll go through and if you guys have a question of the day idea, which we, we haven't done in a while. So we've done, let's see, top, uh, top cereals, uh, top, uh, eighties cartoons. We've done top, uh, top sitcoms from the eighties. So if you guys have any top five ideas that you want me to talk about or see if I can give you a list for the question of the day, go for it. 
All right. First one here. Hmm. I'm picking up. Are we doing a top five list tonight? Yeah, Henry, I just said, yep. All right. The hell is that? I feel like I'm getting banana in here. So banana is going to clue me into one of three distilleries. Jack Daniels, Old Forester, Old Forester slash Woodford, or Barton. So it's one of those three or four. Top 80s movies or 90s. Gelato flavors. <laughs> gelato flavors. Should I do gelato flavors? That's kind of a good one. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, on the palate, I'm definitely guessing. I'm sorry. On the nose, I'm definitely guessing it's one of those four because I'm just getting that banana note. It's coming right out of the glass. Um, all right. This has some age to it. This definitely has some age to it. Oak. A lot of sweetness. This is delicious. A lot of sweetness here. Um, wow. I'm, I don't think it's a super high proof. Michael McDonald, top five rainbow cookie bakeries. I didn't have to watch that shit growing up. I didn't have to like find a bakery growing up. It was my grandma was making those. So Barton banana is candied banana. Yeah, you know what? I'm kind of leaning towards Barton here. It's not like that. It's not the Jack Daniel. Well, it could be Old Forester too. It's it's not that like the Jack Daniels um like trail mix banana chip banana. This is more of a little bit of a of a refined banana, if that makes sense. A refined banana. That's terrible. Hashtag band name, Refined Banana. Mark it up. Lock it in, guys. If anybody names their next band Refined Banana, I want royalties. Um, <laughs> man, that yeah, that definitely has some age to it. Top five cocktails. Top five Jordan shoes, ones he wore playing only. Oh, I like that one. I might. You guys want to see the Jordans I'm rocking tonight? Because I'm, I'm pretty proud of these. I found these in Chicago when I was there. These are a pair I've been looking for for a while. These are the Jordan 1 Ama Meniers. Look at these beautiful babies. So, Ama Manier is a, uh, it's, it's kind of a boutique uh, fashion, uh, boutique fashion show, uh, fashion shop. And their creator does these really, really cool collabs with Jordan. They've done on Jordan 3s, they've done on Jordan 4s. This is the Jordan one that I wanted, and the color, that like cranberry color, it's supposed to be it's supposed to replicate the color of blood. So like blood, sweat, and tears going into the to the shoe. You have the, uh, the laces, and then inside you have like this. I don't know if you could see it, but it's like this quilted, this like quilted pattern on the inside. These shoes are beautiful, and um, this is kind of like a a textured leather, almost like a pitted leather type of type of texture that it's got i love these shoes that's the logo the a is for the ama um they they just do an incredible job there's the uh, the bottom of the sole you get a little bit better of a of a picture of the color i love these are my new favorite shoes and so i'm so glad i got them uh kitten bacon team what's going on nice short exam another vote for grunge bands oh grunge bands oh that's a good one too um all right, top grunge. You know what? Let's do that. Top grunge bands. Uh, I mean, Jordans would be pretty easy, like ones that he wore. Um, I could do that real quick, but let me let me try to get through most of this uh, blind here because it's already getting late. All right, I think I'm gonna guess this is about. I'm gonna guess 14 years old. Proof. I'm gonna guess. It's, I don't think it's a high proof, guys. I think I'm. this is like maybe, I'm just going to say like 100 proof. 
And if I had to guess a distillery, I'm going to guess that. I don't know if I want to go Barton or if I want to go Old Forester. Like, but something that old, I'd be more inclined to go for Barton. So I'm going to say Barton. Like it could be like a like a Calumet or something like that. You know, or one of these other ones that are, oh, it could be, um, what's that? What's that brand that's doing a lot of like high priced sourced um, Barton? Uh, damn it. It's going to drive me nuts. I can't think of the name of it. Somebody in the chat, you guys will have it. It's like a $250 bottle. It's like sourced Barton. They came out with some single barrels. Yeah. Must be nice. Sell your shoes and put those dollars into mutual funds. Thank me later. <laughs> uh, no, not lucky. Oh, well, Lucky 7 is actually a good... Lucky Seven's a good call out. It could be Lucky 7. But there's another one. There's another one. Lucky 7 isn't 250 Lucky 7's like, what, 160 Best three meats for a meatball. Veal, pork, or beef. <laughs> You got to use all three. Actually, I don't use veal anymore. I just use pork and beef for my meatballs. Augusta. That's it. Thank you, Mero. Thank you. It is Augusta. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's go to number two here. Oh, that one. This one kind of has the same, like, vibe. It's got, like, more banana. What is going on tonight? Is this, like, right? Or am I just getting all the bananas? What's happening? It's a little fruit forward. I, I don't really dig that. It's actually very fruit forward. That's interesting. Mm, weird finish on it, though. What the hell is that? It's a lower proof. Not a, Yeah, that's a much lower proof. That might be like a 90 proofer. Maybe 86, 90. I'll say 90 proof. I don't think that's old at all. Uh, that could be a seven, six year bourbon. But it definitely has a funky finish on it. I think it's got a finish on it. That either has a finish on it or it's some weird mash bill. Because I'm getting a lot of fruit on it. Maybe it's kind of some kind of a weird weeder. But I'm getting the banana on it too. So is it something like, maybe that's his weird experimental thing? That's weird. Whatever it is, I'm not digging it. <laughs> I'm not digging that one. I do think it's a bourbon. Um, as far as where it's from, I, I don't know. Like, I am getting that banana again. Maybe it's Old Forester? I don't know. Maybe it's an Old Forester 117 I haven't had yet. Yeah, that one's weird. Jason, are you still picking up Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof rise? They're finally landing in Cali. Yeah, as long as I know it's a it's a good one. I'm definitely picking those up. All right, so best I'm gonna have to like look at a list here. Um, best grunge bands. I'm I'm just kind of looking at uh, like a list here, so I could kind of pick out my my tops here because I have obviously I have a bunch. Um, okay. I don't know. Are they considered? I wouldn't consider them. Would you guys consider Tool grunge? I don't think Tool is grunge at all. So they're not on. Tool is one of my favorite bands of all time, but I don't think they make this list. All right, number five for me on this list for top grunge bands of all time, I'm gonna go with Candlebox. I love Candlebox. Open for Rush, the first concert i ever saw as a kid camel box opened up for rush loved camel box so camel box i put is number five all right let's go to number three here yeah tool isn't grunge i agree all right let's go to this one here this one i'm not getting really much on the nose here Yeah, Camelbox. I and I only I think I only pick Camelbox is because you know 
I saw them so early on when I was getting into like the grunge music stuff. Oh, that one's weird in a good way. It almost has like a dusty funk to it. There's like a dusty type of note to it. Um, I have no idea. That one is weird. Number four, I would probably have to go with uh, Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains are probably number four. Um, number three, I would probably get to Soundgarden. Chris Cornell is just ridiculous. Number three is probably Soundgarden for me. I mean, a lot of these are probably pretty interchangeable. I have one distinct number one, though. Number two, though, number two, there, there's a lot of, uh, hmm, number two. What did I say? Number four, Alice in Chains. Number three, Soundgarden. Number two would have to be... <sighs> number two, I would have to get to Smashing Pumpkins. And then number one, Pearl Jam for me. I think that's my top five. Uh, do, I mean, I, I, Smashing Pumpkins, I think the stuff they did musically was incredible. It was just such interesting music. I think... You know, you can make an argument for Stone Temple Pilots in there somewhere too for me, but I don't I don't think they had enough of a longevity for me. But Smashing Pumpkins for me, I absolutely loved. Uh and then number one, I would you kind of have to give it to Pearl Jam. Nirvana to me, I could see an argument there, but I was never really that into Nirvana. I just thought they were a little bit, I don't know, they were a little bit overrated, but, but that's me. Yeah, Nirvana isn't um Nirvana isn't my wasn't really Nirvana is definitely top 10 but not my personal top 5. I just I don't know. Like I like their music, but I just I never thought that they were like as amazing as everyone thought they were to me. I think the the whole like aura around them really kind of built up that that uh that legendary status they had. Um I have no idea what what the third one is. I'm going to say it's 100 and Three ish proof. I'll say 110 just to be safe. I'll say 110 proof. Um, I think it's a bourbon. And I have no idea what the distillery is. It is it is a weird, funky mix. So I'm gonna say it's a uh it's gotta be a single barrel of something. Maybe it's like a weeder of some sort. I'm gonna say it's a weeder. I, I don't know what that one is. All right, let's go to four. Ugh, four, I do not like the smell of number four. What the fuck is that? Ugh, four has got like that Jeff the Creed note to it. What the, the hell did you give me, man? I'm not even drinking that again. That's awful. I don't know what that is, but I don't like it. <laughs> oh, dude, what'd you? <laughs> I, Justin, I hope these all weren't experiments. I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> that one's gross. You know what? I don't even care what the fuck the proof is. I'm not drinking that anymore. Oh, Blind Melon. Blind Melon was a big favorite, too, but they had, like, two or three songs. The longevity wasn't there. <coughs> Nirvana, because Dave Grohl was a drummer. Yeah, I, I totally... But I would actually... I prefer Foo Fighters over Nirvana. I think they're... I think Foo Fighters has a much uh, more interesting catalog than Nirvana does. Um, I hear it gets better on the third sip. Yeah. Oh, Dinosaur Jr., Nathan. That's That would be in a top ten. Uh, yeah, number four is terrible. That one's out. I don't know what the hell that is. All right, let's go to number five. 
Oh, number five smells like candy. It is absolute candy in a glass. All right, now we're on to something here. Number four, you're going home. Number five smells a lot better. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> okay. Now we're talking. This is just pure vanilla extract, toffee. Oh, man. Vanilla icing. This is a vanilla bomb. All right, let's just want to try this one coming off that nasty number four. Oh. Okay. This might be the highest proof one we've come across. I, I think we're looking in the one, at least between 118 and 120, somewhere around there, maybe even higher. But it's drinking really sweet. Um, this one's kind of nice. Wow. Yeah, this is definitely a higher proof. A lot of cherry. Just a ton of vanilla. This is this is pure candy in the glass, guys. I, I can't even stress that enough. Um, I think that's like 125 proof. I mean, that thing is just going down strong. Um, God, what the hell is that? That's got to be something finished with that type of proof on it. It's just, or something younger. I don't know what that is, but that is a high proof, very sweet. Maybe that's one of the blends with like some light whiskey in it. That is super sweet. I'm going to say light whiskey. All right. Last one here, guys. Sonic Youth. Oh, okay. Sonic Youth, I... The Smiths, would you guys consider the Smiths as grunge or was Smiths like, like more emo? Because I did love the Smiths. Smiths was kind of like one of those bands like I listened to. Like I didn't tell anybody I was listening to Smiths, but I was listening to the Smiths. <laughs> was was the Smiths considered grunge? I don't know. No, no, no. No, the Smiths. Okay, so yeah. All right, so the Smiths are more goth, like emo-like type stuff. Okay. More alternative for the Smiths. Camel box for the win. Well, I guess most of the chat were born in the 80s. Some serious grunge taters. Is <laughs> any I don't, yeah, I don't think the Smiths are grunge. All right, let's go to the last one here. Yeah, I mean, I did like the cure, um, but yeah, they were definitely goth. Oh, this is definitely light whiskey. It's either light whiskey or it's rum, because it smells like rum. And if this is rum. Usually when I smell like rum-like whiskeys, it's usually light whiskey. Um, man, that is stupid sweet. This is powdered sugar. It's not even like vanilla extract. I'm actually getting like a really sweet bubblegum note here. Whoa! That's definitely light whiskey. Holy shikes. that is that is uh jet fuel <laughs> i mean is that like freaking obtainium or something is that like a crazy light whiskey or maybe is it, is it an old card or american whiskey maybe it's pretty damn good oh yeah this is this is cotton candy bubble gum vanilla like rum in a glass that is crazy the cranberries, Nathan, I, I could not disagree with you more. I could not stand. Listen, she was talented, but I could not take her voice. The whole like, yeah, that's my that's my impression of the uh, of the cranberries. I couldn't take her voice, man. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it for a sustained amount of time. I could not do it, dude. This thing is crazy. That is, I'm saying that's light whiskey. I don't know if number five is light whiskey anymore because I think number six is definitely light whiskey. That shit is like 135 proof, <laughs> I think. Damn. I think my favorite is actually number one, all the way going back to number one. All right, so let's recap here. Number one, I said 14 years old, 100 proof, and Barton. 
Number two, I said is 90 proof. I said Old Forester maybe. Um, number three, I said 110 proof, a bourbon, and I had no idea where the hell that was from. Uh, number four, I hated, so I didn't care where that was from. Number five, I said maybe it was light whiskey, maybe 125 is proof. Um, and this last one I thought was completely light whiskey. Now, light whiskey tends to be a high age. So if I had to guess an age of that one, I don't know, light whiskey is what? Normally, I'll just say 15 years. That's generally what you get in light whiskey. Jason, off topic, but how do you compare the New Riff 8-year to the Four Roses single barrel? I actually think the New Riff 8-year has more depth to it, to be honest. Hole did have a moment. Veruca salt over cranberries. Oh, that's a good... God, I hope that cranberry is a personation on Matt Madness. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, guys, tonight, I haven't done it yet, uh, my tasting notes as Kermit the Frog. Let's go with the last one here. Uh, on the nose, it's uh, extremely sweet. It uh, has a rum uh, quality to it, right, Piggy? Uh, maple syrup. Uh, cotton candy, which is my favorite. And uh, it is burning my throat. Ah! <laughs> I made it a point. I was like, I got to do uh, Kermit the Frog tonight doing tasting notes. Uh, Jason can do Kermit like I can do Smeagol and Gollum. <laughs> nice. All right, let's find out what these are. These are back here, I think. Yep. Put the paper back here that he gave me. All right. Let's see what we got. Let's see uh, how bad or good I was here. Um, all right, so everything is color-coded. So here are the color-coded dots. So this is one. This is the purple one. Holy shit. I was pretty spot on with this one, guys. Here we go. I said it's 100 proof. It's actually 103 proof. I said it was 14 years old. It's actually 15 years old. And I said it was Barton. And it is Sam Houston 15 year, which is Barton. Holy shit. I'm very proud of myself. I nailed that one. Um, this was the Indiana 3 batch or the Indiana 3 uh, offering. Interesting. Okay. Dude, I'm I'm really happy. I, I kind of nailed that one. I uh, got really close. So, uh, all right. So my palate's not completely broken too much yet. It's still pretty good. <laughs> Let's go to number two. What's the color here? So this is the light blue. And this is, I said, 90 proof. I said it was a bourbon, and I thought it was Old Forester. Um, so it's not Old Forester, but it is Woodford Reserve. And this is 90.4 proof, so it was right on with the proof. And this is a bourbon I have never had before. This is the Sonoma Triple Finish. Um, I would have never guessed that. <laughs> so I did say it was fruit forward, but I would have never guessed that that was the Sonoma Triple Finish. But at 90.4 proof, it was okay. Uh, again, this, this just plays into my... And to my belief that I'm not paying a higher price for any Woodford Reserve special, um, uh, special like releases anymore. So, uh, John Legalva says, "Quit while you're ahead." Yeah, exactly. I should just stop right now. Um, okay, so I didn't do too bad with that one. Number three, I'm really interested because I had no idea what the hell that was. Number three is the pink. I said it was 110 proof. It's 107 proof. 107.9, so it's closer to 108. So I was pretty close on the proof. Uh, I said it was a bourbon, which it is. And I said I had no idea what the hell it was. <laughs> I said it had a dusty weirdness to it. And the son of a bitch put my own friggin' barrel pick in it. It is the peerless single barrel apple funk that uh, the Master Journey Whiskey Club picked like years ago. Um, this is the barrel that actually got lost in New Orleans which is why we got access to these bottles, uh, these really special barrels, as kind of a makeup. 
So, but yeah, I haven't had it in so long. I had no idea what that was, but it's a peerless. Yeah, I mean, we called it Apple Funk for a reason. It's funky, um, for sure. So that makes sense. All right, number four. This one, I don't even want to know what the hell what the hell it is. Yellow. Echo Barrel Proof Bourbon, batch number one. A hundred and and twelve point four proof. That stuff is shit. No, thank you. Keep it. Never give me that sample ever again. <laughs> that was, oh my God, that was not great. Okay. Uh, number five. This was his experimental one. All right, guys. Hold on to your seats for this one. Buffalo Trace Burai. Aged in new white oak barrel soaked in Captain Morgan private stock. Age 16 months in a five liter barrel. I said 125 proof. It's 124.5. It is a Buffalo Trace Burai. So he didn't write exactly what he used. I'm guessing Buffalo Trace and Sazerac or something like that. Um, oh my God. That thing is no wonder it was so damn sweet. It tasted like freaking candy. Um, okay, so that was it. So that was his experimental one. That's pretty cool, dude. That actually wasn't that bad. And the last one I thought was like 135 proof light whiskey. And it is what did I say? 15 years. Oh shit, it's 18 years. This is Jacob's Pardon, 18 year, 99% corn, 142.7 proof. The palate still works, guys. That's all I'm going to say. The palate still works. Uh, okay. So, uh, fun blind flight. He was not kidding. This thing was all over the map. The only thing that was missing was a rye, and that Echo Spirits bottle almost pretty much broke my palate. So, uh, <laughs> so thanks, JD, for providing this amazing blind. appreciate it. So, uh, cheers to all of you for watching tonight. Thanks for, uh, for hanging out. If you go, if you want, head on over right now to Women of Whiskeys. They are uh, they are live right now, and uh, definitely go give them su some support. Absolutely love you guys. Thanks for hanging out tonight. It was fun to kind of go through some uh, some blind tasting, some samples. Again, thanks to Glens Creek Distilling for sending this. Cheers to Matt Porter for this amazing blend, um, and thanks for the support. Uh, with that, as I always say, it's not about the whiskey; it's the people you share it with. Cheers, and I'll see you next week right here on the Mass and Drum. Take care, folks.